Welcome to St. Thomas Methodist Church in Plettenberg Bay. The message is brought to you by Rev. Timothy Rist. And so, Father, as we stand before you this morning, we bring you our voices, our songs, our praise. We bring you the honor and the glory that we can. And we bring you our lives. No greater offering can we bring than our love and our lives. And so receive us. No matter who we are, Father, we know you welcome us with your open arms. And so you receive us and we thank you for that, the grace of that moment. And receive our tithes, our offerings, the gifts that we bring. And may we and all that we bring be your glory and majesty, your healing, your ministry, your grace at work in the lives of others in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again. And uh, I know some folk came in just as we were singing our first song, so perhaps you want to look around again. Uh, and you're allowed to hug now. COVID is done, eh? Hey? <laughs> so if you even want to get up and hug someone you haven't seen for a while, would you do that? Or you can shake a hand, pat on the back. Would you do that? Say good morning, welcome the family around you. Come, eh? Hey? Yeah. If you're joining us for the first time as a guest or you've been away for a while, the theme we're looking at is called Faith Packing. And I'll, uh, if you don't mind, if I can just take a moment to explain to you what that means. We were talking about how we need to learn to carry our faith, represented by this backpack, carry our faith deliberately with intent throughout our journey with the Lord this year. And then inside the faith pack are tools that we need to use. And I use the illustration of climbing rope. I've got climbing rope in here. I've got a climbing harness in here saying that those tools teach us to trust. We must trust God that He is who He is, trust God that He will do what He can do, and we carry that trust in our faith with us. Remember I said, I cannot carry your faith, neither can you carry the faith of another. We each carry our own faith. It's our business with God. Then last week, we spoke about mountain passes, saying that as we journey together, and we emphasize that, we're not journeying alone ever. We are with God and we are with each other. And so as we journey together, we understand we will have to traverse these mountain passes. And we said they are beautiful. The scenery on either side of the passes is majestic. God is with us. Majesty is all around. Yet there are these difficult moments we must navigate together. And we will do that uh, prayerfully with songs. And you'll hear this morning with, with mentorship, with guidance, words of support etc. We all journey with God with each other as we traverse these mountain passes. Also, that image, you might be wondering, so what's that picture got to do with anything today? Well, in faith packing, we need to understand too that we must live in God's presence, and I'm calling it the tent of presence. Here it is, that very tent on the screen. It's this little one that I've got, uh, and I'll explain how I landed up in the snow like that at one stage. But bear this image in mind of carrying a tent with our faith pack. And I'm going to be borrowing quite a few images uh, from the Old Testament for that. By the way, that tent is about the size probably of this altar table. Not much bigger than this. Uh, so just to give you a perspective. So we're looking at faith packing and specifically this week the tent of God's presence. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are many images of the people of God uh, having to learn what it meant to travel together on a journey. And I'll ask, ask you to go back to those stories of the Exodus. Right? So perhaps you've read them. So the, the, the people of Israel, of Israel, the Israelites, on a journey with God, that journey began when they fled Egypt. And as the stories tell us, they're now on this journey together with God through the desert, on their way to what they are calling the promised land. There's almost this hint that when we get to the promised land, all this journey is done. But we know, friends, don't we, that when they got to the promised land, the journey continued. It morphed into different ways of seeing God and understanding God. That journey focused eventually on Jesus his life and his ministry, his death on the cross. That journey is continued through the Jesus experience, the gift of Jesus to the world. Salvation come to us 
that journey is continued to you and me. And we are invited, I'm asking you to join me and others on a journey with God, a faith-packing journey. And so getting back to the Old Testament times, the people of Israel, very much living like nomads, moving from place to place. We're told in the texts that God leads them with a pillar of cloud by day. Just bear that image of cloud. Whenever a cloud appears, Old Testament, God is there. God speaks, right? So a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. Can you think of a, a New Testament example of God's presence by fire? Pentecost, right? Fire, cloud, God is with them. A journey, we are told, that took 40 years, a very, very long time, a holy journey with God and with each other. So, there's a scriptural proof of what I'm saying. Well, Exodus 13, from verse 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Get the idea of God leading them on their journey. And friends, this faith-packing journey of the Israelites changed the people and the understanding of God, of, of who God is, of how God works with them, of how God is longing to change them and to grow them. God challenging them about their need to change and to grow on the journey. The tent of God's presence. Exodus 25 from verse 8, God gives this instruction to, Israel, to the Israelites, obviously through Moses. Then have them, the people, make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Exodus 26 from verse 1. How's this for a design? Just a little glance, a glimpse. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue purple and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. Wow, and if you go on into that chapter, there's this uh, plan for the tabernacle laid out for the people, beautiful, intricate in its designs. And I did, when I read all of this, I thought, where did they find the materials on their journey? Where did they find? Those colors are not just accidental, friends. They are mentioned uh, linen, very, very expensive material to get hold of. Blue, purple, scarlet yarn, very expensive dyes. So he's saying, not just any El Cheapo structure, only the best. Then verse, chapter 26, verse 30, he set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. And who was that plan given to? Well, given to Moses, that time that Moses had with God on Mount Sinai. And so this tent, this tabernacle, this structure that they could carry from one place to the other was to be an example of the power of God with the people. It was also the sense that God's power is now sealed in a covenant that God has made with his people. He says, my presence is here. I am living among you. You can see the place, the tent I live in. I am right here. But there's an agreement we have about keeping my power in this place. So the covenant is part of that agreement, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And God says, you will worship me and worship me alone. And what is formed from there is also what we call the Book of Covenant or the Book of the Covenant. Wonder what that is? Exodus chapters 20, 21, 22, 23. Build a special place that I may live in and where you can meet with me. But not just anyone can build this tent of God's presence where his power will live. Exodus 31, I have given ability to all the skilled workers, their skills are a blessing from me to them, to make everything I have commanded you. Verse 7, called the tent of meeting. The ark of the covenant law with the atonement cover on it, 
and all the other furnishings of the tent, the table and its articles, the pure gold lampstand and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, you get the picture, and also the woven garments, both sacred garments for Aaron, the priest, and garments for his sons when they serve as priests, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them just as I commanded you. And the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Quite a dramatic picture, eh? Surely. This tent of meeting. And as I was reflecting on that phrase, there's another example from Exodus 33 that Moses uses, called the heading there is the tent of meeting. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down. Remember cloud? It's an example of God's presence. The pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So friends, the protection of God, the power of God with us, but now the protection of God, and I need you to really pay attention to the picture that you're seeing. As I've told you, that tent is my tent. That moment is my moment that you see on the screen. And that's a precious time of experience for me. So what happened? Well, on that particular day, uh, or the day before the snow event, uh, two staff members and I took a group of bridging year students, in other words, post matrix, and we took them to the back end of Hogsback. Uh, and we'd been there for a couple of days, actually. And there was a, a mountain behind us, so a cliff face and a, a tabletop of the mountain. And we had said to these young men that we were going to take them up. There's a big rock fall in the front, a glaciated fall, these huge big boulders that had rolled down, and uh, hundreds of meters long. And we had said, what we were going to do is teach them to navigate this. And on the top of the mountain were some beautiful rock pools and so on. Um, but we were going to show them these events. So off we went. And when we were, got to the top, it took us a couple of hours to get there and found the pools. And they were having a wonderful time of relaxing. And we'd looked at the sky, and the sky above us was wonderfully blue. So we're standing on the mountain now looking towards Port Elizabeth and Grahamstown, obviously from a distance, saying, wow, what a beautiful day. On our left-hand side towards East London, we picked up something was starting to happen out at sea. Just far, far away we could see this cloud bank starting, and a friend of mine who was, whose job it was to have the specialized weather apps went onto his app to find out what was going on. And there was a storm warning that was building. And so we thought, well, how long will it take that formation to arrive where we are? What's, what's it mean? And then the warning said it was going to move, not over East London directly at us, it was going to move sort of behind us, around the old sort of Sky, Transky, old Transky areas, around and would come down with an unusual system. And so after consulting with one another, we decided, right, we better get these young men and young women off this mountain because it would take us a number of hours. Can you imagine the moaning and the protesting and why should we get out of the pool and what's going on? Wah, 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 wah. And eventually they walk with us and it takes us a few hours and we get back to the camp. And so we're sort of in the valley of this, camp, uh, of this mountain, the shadow of the mountain. 
We then went around to all the, the tents and we said, let's make sure the gear is all tightened down, ready. But remember, the sky still looks wonderful above us. And the moaning and the groaning and the carrying on. But we made sure everything was secure. And then shortly after the sun went down, we thought we heard what sounded like a train on its way. And there were gullies down the cliff faces towards where, where, where we were in the valley. And we heard the sound do, 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 growing like this. Bah, 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 bah. And eventually the wind just arrived and it hit us. And all the tents shuddered like this. And everyone scrambled and went inside in their tent. And during the night, the storm raged. And at one stage, the, the winds dropped. And if you've been in lots of snow, you understand it becomes very quiet. And when we woke up the next morning, that's what was around us. That had been dumped on us during the night. And some of the, the young men and women in their tents were unable to get out the tents because they were in areas a little bit more hollowed than we were, and the, the snow had... So there was lots of fun in terms of digging the tent out and all of those things. They were safe. But that picture stays with me because there was a whole lot of discussion and talk and planning about how we need to be ready to make sure there's protection. I'll carry on to the story in a moment. But when I was in the tent uh, and obviously realized what had happened, Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Remember, trust is one of the tools we are carrying in our faith pack. And when the crisis comes and I'm living in the protection of who God is, his power and his protection, I'm safe. Can we go back to that picture of the, the, the tent in the snow just for a moment? Friends, I didn't choose that tent because I like yellow and orange. The people that design these things understand that when you are in a place of crisis and you are like we were there, the color that your brain registers first, the colors are yellow and the sort of yellow orange, burnt orange. So when you're looking to rescue someone, if you're wearing gear colored like that, they will see you quickly. I only found out about this after this. When you're inside a tent like this, uh, the inside is yellow and orange. And I thought initially, oh, my word. No, especially on a bright summer's day. Wow. But when it's dark and it's dingy and the weather's dodgy outside, the inside of the tent becomes quite luminous. And I understand it's to increase, the, it's, it's for, to help with your mental health for those who are trapped in snow for long periods of time. It brings color in. Wow, I thought. And the times that I moaned about putting this tent up because of having to try, and, oh, when your eyes start disappearing on you and you've got to find little sleeves to put poles in. And it only has three poles. But they are designed in such a way that they will stand firm with the guy ropes. And that wind hit us and my tent just shuddered. Went, doo -doo, and then it stopped. Other tents were blown flat. So this leads to this next picture. When we say we're going to live in the tent of God's presence, when we're going to carry the tent of God's presence with us, let's be wise in how we choose to have, have that moment with God because you could have chosen one of these. You could have ignored instructions if you were one of the bridging years and arrived on this excursion with me with one of these gazebo-type flimsy tents because the, you like the view of the mountains. And when the moment of disaster arrives, would that have been there still? blown away. And so God was saying to the old, the Israelites, my grace, my power, my protection is with you, but be wise and build this place in this way. And as we journey in faith together this year, I and others that will be speaking from the front will be asking you to make sure your faith is packed with the right tools, the right equipment, the right things. Do it in the right way. Otherwise, when the disaster comes, you could be literally blown away. 
The other thing about the tent of God's presence and the power of God, it also is moments of privacy. When the crisis is all around, and I understand the dramatic image, when crisis is all around, it's good to be able to withdraw for a moment. That's how I operate. I don't know about you. I need a moment of being able to reflect and to plan, to strategize, to be ministered to, to rest. So make sure you have packed in your faith pack the tent of God's presence. Matthew 6, when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your Father. Go into that private space. Friends, if I stop talking where I am now, I have over these last few weeks given you lots of scriptural theory, faith theory. But in the weeks to come, we are, going, we are, we are the, those of us in the front are going to give you tools, very practical tools, how to study the scripture, how to pray, how to meditate, how to find healing, tools that you will need to make sure that the protection of God's presence is not just a wonderful looking tent on the mountainside and you sitting outside never using it. Right? We need to be in the presence of who God is. So we will give you wisdom. All right? We will, that's a, a great a gift, isn't it? Is that not true? A gift of the Spirit to us is a gift of wisdom. And we will help you find that gift, learn to recognize that gift, work with that gift. All those faith lessons, those life lessons learned while we're working, walking with God. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. One aspect of wisdom to illustrate uh, how that worked for us in the mountains. Whenever we went in with, with children and we would obviously... Well, maybe not the obvious. We'd always hike for a few hours before we'd reach the place where we were going to camp. And as we were going in, every single time, every couple of hundred meters, we would, we would build cans of rocks. Do you know what a can is? Like a pile, almost like a pyramid structure. A can of rocks, probably about so high. And so we'd buy, build these cans, and the kids were told to go and find stones and build the cans. And I ended up having a love-hate relationship with baboons. Because we had built cans on one trip and we'd come back for the next trip and all the cans are dismantled and everything's scattered around. But the kids with us would moan, why must we go and look for these rocks? Why must we waste our time building this? Rev, it's taking so long to get to the campsite. We must just get there. And then the day the snow came. And we could say to the bridging ears, do you understand now? Because it was a whiteout after this. Was, suddenly the mist came down, and literally we couldn't see from here to the, the communion rail, and I'm not exaggerating that. It was just here and snow and white. We were able to turn to the pupils there and say, where's the first can? Now we knew where the can was. And they would hunt for the first can. And then we would gather around the first can, and we'd say, where's the next can? And they'd find the next can. And we went can by can by can to get off the mountain safely together. We were wise enough to build the markers on the road to guide us out, even when the going was good going in. We need wisdom. We need planning. We get that from the Word of God, don't we? And we'll look at that in the weeks ahead as well. The Scriptures... The Word of God come to us. We're going to learn to live from the Word. We're going to learn to live by what is in the Word. And in doing that, we are going to make sure that we use the gifts of those around us. Mentors. And I want to pay homage to our mentors here. And I don't want to mention them by name in case I embarrass them. But there are a number of you sitting here who are mentors to our young adults at the moment. And the mentors, it's deliberately done, Troy and the mentors have got together, and a mentor will take on, adopt a young adult. And every 
so often during a month, we'll get alongside that young adult over coffee somewhere else. How's it going? How's your faith? What do you need any help with, any guidance with? Are you doing okay? Listening to the stories, reflecting the stories with that young person, mentoring them on their journey of faith. Cairns. Let's put markers in place on your journey of faith. Friends, we need mentors. And not only from those who are mature in their faith to those who are new in their faith, but mentors across the generations too. And gentlemen, we really need men to mentor young men. Wisdom imparted from one generation to the next. And then friends, where we pitch our tent as well can be a life-defining moment. Remember that story of the, the, the house on the rock and the house on the sand, New Testament? Wise man built his house on the rock. Foolish man built his house on the sand. Just as an illustration, I will never, when I'm camping, camp on a riverbed or right next to a riverbed in the shallowest part of a valley. Never do that. Camp a bit higher, further away. Maybe a bit of a mission to get to water and all those things. But when the trouble comes, you are safe. Wisdom. As I bring this to a close, John 14, talking about mentoring. John chapter 14 from verse 25. Jesus has been with the disciples, teaching them, training them, mentoring them. And he's now explaining he's going to, need to, he's going to have to leave. Wow, and there's this furor now in the room, and they're talking this through with Jesus. And then Jesus says, hold on, I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with, with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. Another mentor will come. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. I am leaving you well and whole. Right? So the mentor's coming, and so that's my parting gift to you. Peace. Take a breath. You'll be okay. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. The tent of God's presence. What does that mean for you? What does it mean to say to you, for you to say to yourself, I'm living each day in the tent of God's presence, in my space, in my life, in how my life is working. What does that mean for you? And I'm going to this year learn to carry my faith more obviously and with deliberate intent. I'm going to trust the tools that I've been given by God and by the mentors around me, by the family of God I'm with. Those tools, I'm going to make sure they are securely packed. And I understand that the tent of God's presence is my business with God. And so I'm going to find out what the design must be and how it needs to work for me. And I'm going to journey with God, and I'm going to journey with others. I'm never going to journey alone. And I want to just say thank you in using these illustrations. Thank you in his absence, and he will not watch, I'm sure, he won't be watching us online. He's not here. But uh, my mentor in the mountains was Keith James. And over many years, when we worked together, before any time of going into the mountains, he would sit down with Graham and myself. Sometimes he would take us into the mountains for training before and say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is why we are doing it this way. This is what you need to learn. These are the stories you need to pay attention to because if you don't pay attention to these things, it can go horribly wrong. So his wisdom and his guidance and his mentorship allowed me to learn faith lessons, friends, in the mountains. I wonder what stories you carry with you. Trust God to be who he is. Trust that God will act in your life as only God can. Live always in God's presence. How do I do that, Tim? Well, we're going to explain that to you over the weeks ahead. So come, don't miss out. Be part of a small group. 
because that's where you'll learn the most, actually. Our small groups that meet in homes, we call them, we have this broad label called connect groups. And whenever people come together, smaller groups of people, they are connecting to God and one another. So in our connect groups, whether that's in a home fellowship or a mission group, a caring group, a ministry team, whatever that group meeting is, let's learn from each other, let's mentor each other. The awesome difference for us but compared to the Israelites, the Israelites were afraid to be in God's presence. If I'm in God's presence, I will be struck down. I will stand at my tent and Moses can meet with God in God's tent. I will be in this place. God is there. I am here. I'm afraid of God. Jesus says, hey, listen, God's already in the tent with you. That's the amazing gift. God is here. Your Father is with you. Do not be afraid to meet with him. Live, in fact, in his presence. Every moment of every day, live in his presence, now and always. But Jesus also reminds us, and I remind you, please don't ever lose sight of the awesome power and majesty of who God is. Don't dumb down God so much that he fits neatly into your pocket of experience. A web telescope out there in space, a million miles or kilometers, a million kilometers, whichever it is, very far away from the Earth, focused on the smallest, darkest spot of space for months on end, literally one spot for a few months, brought back images of when we looked at, the, at Earth, we said, oh, we know those st- that's a bright star out there. And then when the digital images came back, suddenly discovered, well, that's not a bright star. That's another whole spiral galaxy. It's a galaxy. And around it are galaxies. What we thought were bright stars are galaxies like our Milky Way, friends. And there are billions more galaxies out there than we knew. God is awesome. God is magnificent. God is so much bigger than us. And he says, come and live in the tent of my presence. Live with me, there's power. Live with me, there's protection. Live with me, you'll learn wisdom. Live with me, you'll journey safely when the trouble comes. Live with me. Amen. Thank you for joining us in listening to this message. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this way, you will be notified when the next message is available. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.